I'm always amazed at your response. Sometimes it's applause, this time it was, oh yeah. I guess it, <laughs> I guess it depends on the, the style of the music, what the response is. At the recent preschool pajama story time, I read a book titled, A House That Once Was. It's written in poetic verse by Julie Fogliano. There's a name for you. As two children approach a vacant house, the narrator has us imagine who might have lived there. With each successive stanza, you feel the children's caution in the cadence of Fogliano's words. Deep in the woods is a house, just a house that once was, but now isn't, a home. As the children near the front door, the fourth stanza reads, at the front of the house, the house that is waiting, there's a door that is not really open, but barely, a door that is closed, but not quite, a door that is stuck between coming and going, a door that was once painted white. I stopped reading to ask the children, what's the difference between a house and a home? What makes a house a home? And right on cue, Carolyn spoke up and said, the people who live there. In the same way, a church is not a building or a place, but the people who gather together and relate to one another as followers of Christ. So says Paul are the relationships which make a home reflect our identity in Christ. With each successive passage of Ephesians, Paul has drawn out the implications of our connection to Christ by saying we are to love and serve one another and build up the body of Christ, that is the church. In today's text, he challenges his readers to apply this same behavioral ethic to our household relationships. The topical sentence in this section is Ephesians 5.21. The New International Version translated as a thematic statement of what follows. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. But in actuality, this verb is a participle. That is, it should be translated submitting and as such, it is grammatically linked to the previous section as one of five participles dependent on the main verb back in verse 18, be filled with the Spirit. Yet verse 21 serves as a hinge. It concludes the list of responses that characterize how Spirit-filled followers of Christ treat one another within the church and also introduces how we are to treat members of our own household. Before we hear this passage read, I want to remind us of an important aspect of interpreting scripture, or for that matter, literature of any kind, and that is to seek to understand the original or intended meaning of the author, to know what, what, something of what German scholars refer to as the Sitz im Leben, the setting in life or context of the author and, its, and readers. This requires us to learn something about the social, cultural, and historical setting of the first century. Otherwise, we risk what is known as presentism, which is reading our present values and preferences into the text and distorting its original meaning. Emily gave us a heads up of this last week in her sermon by stating that the socio-historical context of that time and place was both paternalistic and hierarchical. Our granddaughter Zoe has just passed her first birthday and her taste buds are changing. Whereas she once loved broccoli, now she only eats it when disguised with other foods, such as in an omelet. <laughs> if you try to serve her a piece of broccoli by itself, she will push it away and give you a look like, how dare you offer me that? We're about to hear a statement or two that may not be to our liking or difficult to swallow given our modern sensibilities. But before we push it away or stop listening, 
I encourage us to be open to what God's Spirit wants to teach us. With that anticipation, let us give our attention to the reading of God's Word from Ephesians 5, 21 through 6, 9, as read for us by Patrice Freire. Ephesians 5, 21 through 6, 9. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. His body of which he is the savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by washing with water through the word and to present her to her, himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle, or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body. But they fed and cared for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Children. Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy life on the earth. Fathers, do not exacer exacer exacerbate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. Praise the Lord. I told Kent when I saw him this morning, I almost called in sick and said, um, you'll have to preach today. So. <laughs> the crux of this passage depends on how we interpret verse 21 in relation to what follows. Is the exhortation of submission to be understood as mutual? Or is it directed to subjects who are in a subordinate role to persons of authority over them? In support of the first view, scholars argue that the verb submit is found here in the middle voice. And I know this is a lot of English grammar that we're not used to. But I'll remind you, this implies that, the, that it's a voluntary submission of 
acting in a loving, considerate, self-giving way towards one another. This yielding of needs, of the needs of others, is consistent with self-sacrificial love already emphasized in this letter and Paul calls out as exemplified in Jesus. According to Gilbert uh, Belazikian, author of Beyond Sex Roles, this interpretation does justice to the reciprocal pronoun, one another, which changes the meaning entirely. By definition, he says, mutual submission rules out hierarchical differences within church and family. Thus, he favors reading the passage as exhortations along lines of interaction among equals. Thus, wives are to submit to their husbands, and husbands are to submit to wives in exactly the same way. Scholars who argue against this view say the verb submit does not describe a symmetrical relationship since it always has to do with an ordered relationship of subordination where one person is over um, or in authority of another. Nowhere does this verb, uh, where this verb appears, is the exhortation reversed, such as parents submit to your children. Thus, the exhortation is for members of Christ's body to be submissive to those who are in authority over them just as the church is to submit to Christ. Commentator Peter O'Brien says the pronoun one another is not always reciprocal. Take, for example, Galatians 6.2, we're told to bear one another's burdens. This doesn't mean that we exchange burdens with everyone else. I'll take yours, you take mine. But that someone who may be more able should help bear the burdens of someone who is less able to do so. This view better supports the flow of Paul's argument as well. He isn't trying to convince husbands to be mutual in their submission, but rather he argues that they are to treat their wives better than what society and culture expects, far better to elevate and honor them in the same way Jesus served the church and sacrificed himself for her. I remember interviewing a couple once and we were talking about scripture passages for their upcoming wedding and uh, the female said, well, as long as I don't have to say obey. And, and so we read this passage from Ephesians and, and, and she said, oh, I don't like that. <laughs> and I said, well, I hear that you're objecting to the word submit, but, but did you hear the husband is to love his wife and die for her if necessary, which, and, and be willing to sacrifice for her? What do you think about that? Would you rather submit or die? <laughs> <laughs> she said, okay, submit's not so bad. If we follow this view, then the implication of Paul's argument would flow something like this. Submit to one another. And what I mean is, wives submit to your husbands, children to your parents, slaves to your masters. Now, we might ask, why would Paul exhort people who already feel the weight of being subordinate to willfully submit to those in positions of authority over them? Isn't he stating the obvious and being rather demeaning at the same time? But listen to the motivation Paul gives. He says, out of reverence for Christ. And this is not the bowing of the head kind of reverence, but more like falling to one's knees. Literally, it is out of fear of Christ. The only time that phrase ever appears in the New Testament. And in this way, it signifies the sense of awe and responsibility we are to show to one another. Pardon me, we are to show to one another because of the one who is our Lord and righteous judge. In any given society, there are specific guidelines or rules for the order of life, which determines domestic, social, political, and religious behaviors. We follow them all the time, whether we acknowledge it or not. 
these household responsibilities listed here um, order such behaviors according to a Christian ethic. Paul was not interested in overturning the social order in a world where the submission of wives to husbands, children to parents, slaves to masters was the overriding norm. But the tables were not simply conformist either, these, these exhortations. Scholar M. Turner observes that within the hierarchical social order, this list was radical and profoundly liberating. Subordinates are addressed as equals. They have their own calling before the Lord, which is as responsible, honorable, and important as that of their counterparts. To Christ, slaves and masters are equally responsible. Those in authority have different roles, but with greater responsibility. They are not better roles. The value, dignity, and worth of those in a subordinate position is no less than that of persons in positions of authority. Attempts have been made to identify the source of these household codes, whether they derive from moral philosophers or Hellenistic Judaism or Greco-Roman emphasis to reinforce state order, or whether they're distinctly a Christian creation. Whatever their source, the model is unquestionable. It is Christ. The stress of reciprocal obligations on the part of those in authority is distinct and without parallel. Slaves are to be treated well, not simply because they might be more productive, as Aristotle suggested, but because there is one who is lord of both slave and master, and each is accountable to him. What parent cannot relate to the instruction that we're not to exasperate our children, that is, provoke them to anger? From day one, I think parenting is all about learning the right balance of nurture and support with letting go. You have to let go one phase at a time. My sister-in-law saw a picture poster in a, in a doctor's office she visited recently and there's a toddler on a phone. <laughs> and she's saying, at church the other day, a guy in a dress tried to drown me. And I kid you not, my parents just stood there taking pictures. <laughs> oh, to have parents that were more supportive. Bob Mills was a mentor friend of mine whom I met while serving as Carmel's Presbyterian Church's associate pastor. Bob's love of people and recognition of their worth, dignity, and gifts served him well over his span of 36 years working for Mobile Oil, first as an exploration and production engineer and then on to top-level executive positions. His strong ethic for fairness led him to correct Desperate, disparate pay scales for international employees from differing nationalities. He remained steadfast in his values even when superiors encouraged him to go with the flow of business as usual. He was known for his integrity and personal attention to others, which led him to know the names of every employee under his watch, from the cleaning crew to the administration. I recall Bob telling me of a time he was returning to the United States having completed several international executive assignments, first in Libya, then in Nigeria, and eventually in Indonesia. Bob was being invited to serve in a strategic leadership role just as OPEC was exerting its influence on the oil industry. The role was as much a position of recognition as it was responsibility. Career-wise, he didn't dare turn it down. But when he discussed it with his wife, Jo, who was his devoted partner, she simply said, you can move to Fairfax, but I'm going home. 
Bob said, it wasn't so much that Joe made the decision for me as much as she made her desires known. And out of love and devotion to her, I did what was best. He made a sacrifice in demonstration of his love and care for his wife who had done the same for him more years than he could count. In that act, he exemplified what Paul said in this passage. It's not about Joe being subordinate to what he wanted, but about him choosing to love his wife by doing what was best for her, which proved to be what was best for him as well. I have a few pastoral observations about the application of this text for our own context. And the first is simply to say this, that I think the Apostle Paul believed that Christ was returning in his lifetime. You sense that in the urgency of his messages in other letters and, uh, and how he describes um, the, um, the hearing of the gospel and response to the gospel. And it's for that reason that I don't think he addressed the wrongs of the structures of slavery and other injustices. But he said, just get along with the government, the very government that executes him later. Don't make waves, don't disrupt. Fortunately, later Christians said, no, in order to address the wrongs, we have to address the structure. And there's a time to submit, and then there's a time to say what's right is right and what's wrong is wrong. My second observation is not all households reflect the relationships Paul describes in this passage. Some are led by a single parent, unmarried partners, or same-sex partners. Some households are broken families or blended families. And we might ask, what are the responsibilities when they fall outside this ordered norm? While the depiction of order or the line of authority may not apply, the principle of honoring Christ in our relationships is undeniable. Thirdly, Paul speaks of nurturing and caring for children by raising them up to know and serve the Lord. And the exhortation is given to fathers. But in my experience, mothers have often, often have the necessary skills and patience to nurture and instill such spiritual growth in children. At best, we should consider this instruction for parents and not simply fathers. Finally, I grieve whenever I hear pastors use passages like this to advance an authoritarian agenda and to teach a God-ordered hierarchical structure for families. The passage simply assumes an order, but the exhortation is to choose to be subordinate to Christ and responsible for the relationships within our households, especially those in authority. For the Lord to whom everything is done is impartial. If only we heard that and honored that and lived that way. So in the spirit of Fogliano's picture book story, if neighborhood children ventured toward our houses, would they find them ordered according to the loving relationships of their inhabitants or nothing more than an unwelcome building that was once a home? In the same way we're to serve one another and build up the body of Christ, let us value our household relationships and behave in such a way that others know we live in a Christ-honoring home. So be it. Amen.